So now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to TensorFlow and this will also be the, the exercises that you're going to do in the tutorial. So the tutorial for today is, is very light. This actually for, for this part of the semester you're not going to do anything hard, it's just to, to help you get started with TensorFlow. Then the final assignment would be uh, where you have to really uh, do something new with, with TensorFlow. So the idea here, I'm going to talk a bit about the basics of TensorFlow today, uh, the building the computation graph, and then we're going to, to see uh, how to implement logistic regression in TensorFlow. So the, the idea is that it is not only uh, neural networks, it's a more generic framework for doing computations in, in general. Uh, and then we're going to see some, some problems with one neuron and, and so on. The, the same problems that we have revisited, but seeing how we can implement it in, in TensorFlow. And also uh, look briefly at TensorBoard, which is a, a, a tool that comes with TensorFlow that can help you monitor the training of your network and look at the graphs and so forth. So the basic idea, as we saw, uh, we have this uh, backpropagation that we use for training neural networks, but it's just an instance of a, a, a more generic approach, which is to compute automatically the derivatives, so automatic differentiation that goes from the, the final result and backwards through all the functions that are composed to get the final result. And then this way we can propagate the derivatives uh, and compute the derivative of the target function with respect to each parameter that we want to update. So this is basically how things work in TensorFlow. We create a computation graph where each node is an operation and the things that pass through the nodes that are operated on are tensors. Tensors are generic n-dimensional matrices that can have whatever you want. So these are the tensors that are passed on from one operation to the next. So since this computation graph is defined, the, uh, the TensorFlow library can compute the derivative uh, as a function of the parameters. And the parameters we define with variables. So the variables are the parameters that the minimization uh, algorithm will try to adjust. We give a cost function that we want to minimize and then uh, everything is done automatically on the graph. So when uh, TensorFlow executes the computation graph, it will solve that problem of trying to find the, the of computing the derivatives and will uh, start optimizing uh, if we want to or just do uh, any other evaluation that we want. So we can specify what kind of things we want to do, what uh, TensorFlow needs to evaluate, and when we execute the graph, it will do the computation. So basically there is a, a, a difference here in the standard way of using uh, TensorFlow. So this will probably change maybe this year or next year with TensorFlow 2.0, but for now this is the way we do things. We set up the computational graph and then we tell uh, TensorFlow to execute it and all those problems of figuring out how to compute the derivatives and so on, the uh, TensorFlow does automatically. So we define the graph, we create the variables, the variables are those things that TensorFlow will try to adjust to minimize the target function. We, we can also have constants, constants where TensorFlow knows that they are not to be uh, changed. And so uh, this way the TensorFlow knows exactly what it has to adjust in order to uh, train whatever system we want to create. So let's see a simple example here, how we can add two things in TensorFlow, uh, I'm importing TensorFlow. This TF is the usual nickname for, for TensorFlow, like NT for NumPy, for example. And we can create two constants. So A is a, is a TensorFlow constant that has a value of 3. Um, B is a, temp a TensorFlow constant that has a value of 4. You can uh, uh, specify the type of the constant. Otherwise, it will be uh, inferred automatically from the, the value. Uh, and then we create a function, uh, 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 an operation here, sorry, for uh, adding the two of them and we can actually give a name to the function. So this is the, the computation graph. We have these two values coming in and we have this operation called total for uh, adding the two values. <coughs> now, we, 
one thing that you should know, especially if you are experimenting with TensorFlow, is that when we do these kinds of things, like creating a constant and an operation, unless we specify a, a, a particular graph object, these are added to the current default graph. And if you're running this in Spider, for example, and, and you're always running in the same console, each time you run the script, you add to the same graph. So if you don't clear the graph in the beginning, if you run the script several times, then your graph will, will get things duplicated, triplicated, and so on. So one useful tip is to put the reset default graph there. An alternative is if you want to specify which graph, you create the graph object and then use that one, but that, that's just a bit more overhead in writing stuff. This is probably easier, at least for, for experiments and for the kinds of exercises uh, we'll be doing. So we reset the default graph each time we run, we create D2, and then we create the, the operation there. Now we can do, uh, we can add things to the graph. For example, we have a new constant here, C, uh, and we have a multiplication, so this becomes the, the new graph here. The, the result of this sum will now be multiplied by C and give us the, that final result there. So basically what we're doing at this stage is just telling TensorFlow to create the computation graph. TensorFlow is still not computing anything, it's just uh, fitting things together to know what, how the graph is. When we want to run the computation, we have to create uh, a session and then uh, we, we can run this session for uh, executing some uh, operations. We can put here a list of operations that we want to, to run, or we can put one, but from the graph, TensorFlow will figure out which operations it needs to run. So if we want to run result, which is the, this multiplication, then it also needs uh, to have total, and total is this uh, sum of the two constants, so it, it will need to run the whole graph to get there. So this is just a simple example with constants and operations. Uh, and we can create a session, we run uh, the graph inside this session, so session is this object that will run, in this case, the default graph, uh, and then we need to close the session to uh, clean up everything that is being uh, created in, in, uh, during this computation. One simpler way of doing this is to use this uh, context manager, so in Python, in Python, when you use with some object, uh, this block will, at the beginning of the block, call a special method to initialize whatever the, the object needs, and when the block finishes, it will call the, the method to, to finalize and clean up everything. So this way, we don't need to worry about closing the session or registering that session as the default session and so on. We just need, we use uh, with a new session object and give it a name, an alias here, and then we can use that object uh, as we, we want. Okay? Uh, so in this case, for example, I'm asking results to be evaluated, but since this with uh, statement here registers this session as the default session, TensorFlow knows that this uh, operation here will be evaluated within that session. You cannot do this without having a session active because then it will not be able to evaluate the, the graph. So the advantage is this seems a bit uh, uh, bothersome to do it this way and in fact uh, in TensorFlow 2.0 you, you will be able to do things in a more uh, imperative and Python-like uh, way. Uh, there is also uh, uh, a, a mode for TensorFlow, which is uh, for eager evaluation, that you can you can skip this part, this difference between setting up the computation graph and then evaluating. Everything is evaluating as soon as you uh, as you give the uh, the instruction for that. But uh, uh, this way of doing things is uh, has a big advantage because uh, once you set up the whole computation graph. TensorFlow can optimize the computations by using GPU or different CPU nodes or whatever, uh, spreading it to whatever computational uh, devices that you have, uh, and that is uh, uh, makes things a lot more efficient. So let's see uh, what we can do as an example. We'll go back to logistic regression. This is a, a, 
a linear classifier that tries to uh, uh, compute an approximation or a regression to a continuous function that gives us the probability of some example x belonging to class 1. So we assume that there is this probability function uh, and we're going to approximate that function with this uh, expression here. So this is uh, uh, the, that sigmoid curve. It's good for approximating probabilities because it goes from 0 to 1 and it, uh, it is continuous, the, riv uh, the, the derivative is continuous too and so forth. So here we have a set of parameters. We have a bias value that allows us to shift where the function activates and then we have a set of weights which we multiply by the input and as a function of, of that uh, linear combination we put that into the, the sigma function and get the output and we want to train this in order to give us the probability of any example belonging to class 1. So examples that belong to class 0 will have a probability of 0 belonging, if they belong to class 1 they should have a probability of 1 or close to that. So, uh, this, the, the, uh, by maximizing the likelihood, so the maximum likelihood solution to this problem uh, corresponds to minimizing this logistic loss expression. This multiplies the, the target uh, probability. So, the target is 1 for all those examples that belong to class 1 and 0 for those that belong to class 0. This should be the probability that we would estimate for those examples. So we, we multiply that uh, target by the logarithm of this uh, approximation that we are computing here, plus 1 minus the target by the logarithm of, of 1 minus the, that approximation. So basically, if uh, um, this target is 0, then uh, we, uh, we are comparing basically the, uh, counting those that do not match, that don't have the same uh, uh, value here. So, these, in this case, we are looking at those that should be classified as class 0, as ha having zero probability of belonging to class 1, and in this side, we are considering those that should be classified uh, as class 1. So, if there is, uh, uh, sorry, this one that should be classified as class 1, and this one as 0. Because if the target is 0, then this term disappears. If the target is 1, then this term disappears. And then for each of these, there will be an error if the output of our uh, function is not the same as the target. So we add up all these errors, measure this uh, uh, logistic loss here, and uh, we have to change those weights uh, there in the W and the W0 in order to minimize uh, the error. So let's see what we can do, uh, how we can uh, create this graph in TensorFlow. This is the, the complete graph. So we have here the logistic function. We have the bias value here that we are adding to this next uh, input value for the, the sigma function. And then we have these weights, uh, the W there, uh, that we are multiplying by the X, the input uh, from our example. And then we add everything uh, there. And then we have the, the output of this uh, net, uh, this net value here that is going into the uh, target function there. So we have uh, the logarithm, the multiplication, the sum, and then the mean here. So you see all of these, uh, this expression is being decomposed into uh, uh, elementary operations uh, in this graph. And this is what then TensorFlow will use to compute the derivatives with respect to all of our parameters. So our, our parameters will be the variables here, the, the W and the WZ. And then we also have these auxiliary graphs for uh, gradient uh, descent optimization because these are all the, uh, the all of these uh, operations will be fed into the computation of the gradient and then that part of the computation will decide how to adjust the weight at each uh, step depending on a training rate and so uh, allow us to compute the minimum for the logistic loss. So this is how we can uh, do this. I'm going to use this, uh, uh, this data set here. Uh, we're going to use NumPy to load it. The first uh, columns are the, um, uh, the x values 
the last column is the, the target label, 0 or 1. Uh, so we're going to get the, the last column as a column. This is, uh, um, sometimes you, you must remember this, if you just put, uh, ask for this matrix for the last column, then it will give you a one-dimensional vector. Uh, but if you add uh, the, the bracket step, so you are giving a list of columns that you want from the matrix, and this tells NumPy that to retain the same uh, two dimensions for that, and this gives you a vertical column. Uh, of, so a two-dimensional matrix with a single column instead of a one-dimensional vector. And this is important because uh, this is what uh, TensorFlow is expecting when it's doing all those, the, the sums and the multiplication and so on for the, uh, for the census. Then we get all the, the um, uh, features here. We standardize the features. So this is the mean uh, of the, the features matrix in the zero axis direction, so along uh, the road. This will give us a vector with a mean for each column and the same thing for the standard deviation, and then we compute here the, the standardized uh, data for, for this matrix. So, um, I don't know if uh, everyone here knows how to use NumPy and Python. Okay, so if you have questions about this, we can, we can, uh, uh, I can explain that in the tutorial in more detail. But basically what we have here is one variable, epsilon, with the label, for our data set and the variable axis with the features that have been standardized. So in this case there are two features and each of them was, uh, we subtracted the mean of that feature over all the data set and divided by its standard deviation. Now we're going to create two TensorFlow constants with these values. So one TensorFlow constant will have the features and uh, another will have the, the, um, uh, the label here. Uh, actually, you can, uh, we'll see later on how to do this with uh, a bit more sophistication by using placeholders where we can feed in uh, our data during the computation. But for now, to simplify things, we'll put our data as constant. This tells TensorFlow that this is not, these are not parameters to change. This is actually the data that we use. <coughs> now we're going to create the parameters for adjustment. And these we create as variables because TensorFlow will uh, use the variables for optimizing the, the target function. So what we need is here um, these two uh, weights that are going to be multiplied by the, the data matrix. The data matrix has uh, n rows, one for each example in our training set, and two mm -hmm. columns. So we need uh, our weights to have two rows uh, in one column, so we can multiply by the, the input uh, matrix. So we, are, we uh, must fit the tensors together when we do these operations. Okay. And we're going to create a bias variable. This is just a, the a scalar value here. We, it's going to start at zero, whereas the weights are going to start with a, a normal distribution at random and have uh, this shape. So we create a uh, an operation here, which is uh, the net, the, this net uh, object there, which is the, the operation of adding the multiplication of x, the input, the features, by the weight, and then adding the bias value. Here. So this, what we're doing here, is this part here, multiplying the weight by the input features and adding the bias value. And then the output is the sigmoid function applied to this one. So this is the output variable that I created here, which is the result of feeding this into the sigmoid function, which is this part. We are feeding this uh, net value here inside the function and getting the, the output. Now, uh, I'm going to create the cost function. The cost function is the, the mean value for these operations. So this is the, the label multiplied by the logarithm of the, the output of the sigmoid, and plus one minus the label multiplied by the logarithm of one minus the sigma. This is the, the logistic loss function, which actually you have a logistic loss function or the, the, the cross entropy function in TensorFlow, but I just implemented it like this, so to, to be more explicit in this example. 
And then what we need now is to uh, create the optimizer, which is the object that is going to figure out the derivatives and adjust the variables to optimize the cost function. So we're going to create this uh, using a, a gradient descent optimizer object. There are different algorithms. This is actually not the best one, but I'm going to talk a bit more detail about them. But this is just the basic one. It figures out the, the gradient, uh, the arrow, the, the vector for where to, to move the, the variables, and then it gives one step into that direction. Uh, so we create that with the learning rate. In this case, that has a value, the, the size of the step is 0 0.1. And our op operation for training will be to use the optimizer we created to minimize this uh, cost function that we created here. So we give it as uh, an argument, that operation, and we are saying that the operation of training is the minimization of that uh, operation, that cost function. Now, if we have variables, remember that when we are doing this, we are creating a variable that has, uh, a random, uh, has random values and so on. Uh, we need to have an operation that when the, the uh, computation starts, initializes the, value, the variable. So we're going to create that operation too, which is this uh, global variables initializer that just does that, initializes the variable. So this, at this point, there were still no computations. We are just specifying what are the elements of the graph and what are the things, how things fit together. But nothing has been executed so far. So now we create a session. With this session, we run the initialization. So this is, init is the one that initializes the, the variable. And then for each epoch, for 50 epochs, we run the training uh, uh, operation. So the training operation, remember, is the minimization of the loss function with this step. And this is done, the, the cost uh, function is computed by, uh, with the tensor of all the outputs that were computed with all the data that we input because we put everything in the constant here. So basically, one step in training, one call to that uh, optimization, uh, to, that, to that gradient descent optimizer, is one epoch because we are using the whole data, we are computing everything with the whole data set, and then we are step, giving one step in the direction of the gradient. And now we do that 50 times. So this is 50 epochs, and this is what happens. This is the data. This is where uh, the, the, per, the variables that we have, all those weights, are placing the, the line that discriminates between the two classes. And this is the error along the, uh, the different epochs. So you see, as we call that operator, it computes the gradient, computes the derivatives, and gives one step with this learning rate. And then we call it again and again and again, and we are going down in the cost function until uh, the uh, regression learns to the best way to split uh, this step. So this was not a neural network. This model is a logistic regression. We use the cost function of the logistic regression and so on, and then we train that iteratively in this way. Yeah. How long do we produce a new example? Well, after you have this, after you train, you have the variable set. Uh, so uh, this initialization uh, gives a random value to the variable. But then each time you run the, the training, it adjusts the variable. But when you finish training, you have all the variables with the, the correct values. So now, if you, uh, you could add a different, or one thing you could do in this case is just to compute the output of an example. So you would need, in this case it would not work because if every, everything is done with constants, you would need to create a new operation for other constants. Actually, we'll see next week that you can use placeholders that you can then feed in data before computing the graph. So what you would need here is to give a new set of examples and just compute the output instead of the everything for the optimization. So you would run the, sesh, the output on the session given the new data. So let's see what we can do to train one neuron, for example, for the OR problem. This is the one that they can, uh, one neuron can solve. And this is very similar to what we have in logistic regression. 
Because if we have one neuron with a sigmoid activation, this is basically what that neuron does. It outputs the sigmoid of the, the weighted sum of the inputs. So we, we have basically the same uh, code here. Instead of loading that data, I'm creating uh, data for the, the, this R example. So we have false, 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 true, true, false, true, true. And then we have the target label, false and true for all the others. Uh, these uh, Y values should come as a column, so I'm reshaping it here uh, uh, to match the same shape as the example. Uh, other than that, it's the same thing, I'm creating the, the constant. Usually we use a uh, float with 32 bits in uh, TensorFlow because uh, it's, it's ideal for GPU acceleration, that's what GPUs uh, use. And also because some things in TensorFlow I think are still not implemented for other uh, types of float. So if you leave it as, as default at float 64, you can have some problems in some operations. But in any case, if you want to use GPU acceleration, you have to use float 32 because that, that's what uh, uh, runs on, on the GPU. <coughs> so uh, we do the same thing. We create the weight, the bias, the bias the, the output with the sigma, this is the same thing. The thing all I changed is instead of using this uh, logistic loss function uh, for the cost, uh, which is what logistic regression uses, we can use, for example, uh, m uh, mean square error for the cost to try to adjust the value of zero or one. But the rest is the same. We create the optimizer, we minimize, and then uh, this is the graph is similar. It's a bit more simpler here because we are using just the square value there and not that uh, those logarithms and so on. But this is basically the same thing. And now we do the same thing here. We start the session. We run the initializer to get the initial value. And then we do the, the training, and this is again the, the result. So, as you can see, you have something that you can use to implement whatever kind of, whatever model you want in this, this type of model. It doesn't have to be a neural network, it can be one neuron, logistic regression, whatever. As long as you set up the, the uh, graph for the computation, and then uh, the tensors will, be, will pass through all the operations, and uh, uh, the minimizer will solve. Uh, your parameters will give you the, the right parameters. So now let's try to do the same thing but with the exclusive R. The only thing that changes is here in the label. Uh, the true true now becomes false uh, with the exclusive R. The rest is the same. And now we have this problem. You see that the error doesn't go below, below 0 0.25 and uh, the frontier is trying to find some place but the problem cannot be solved with a linear classifier. So let's go, let's create a, a neural network with, with uh, three neurons, as we saw before. Uh, but bef uh, before this, uh, note that uh, we have the data here, but the rest is already implemented, the, the neuron and the, and the optimizer and so forth. So if we want to apply this to a different data set, all we need to do is to change the data there. So we, we do the same thing as before, we load this gene data that we use for the logistic regression and then just run our model with now with a, uh, with a square quadratic error cost function and uh, the rest is the same. So you, can, you don't need to use always the same kind of cost function, depends on what you want and what you're trying to, to implement. Uh, the thing is that you need to use a cost function that can be, that has the derivative, that you can compute the derivative so that you can find the solution. If we try to use this on a different data set, for example this one, then it's very hard because this one is not linearly uh, separable. It tries to find the best way of splitting, but it's still not a very good way and has uh, lots of errors. Anyway, we have the, the, the graph set up. All we need to do is to load the data that we want and run again. So let's go to the multilayer perception and the idea here is that we're going to use the hidden layer to change the representation of the data so that the output neuron can uh, separate the, uh, the points correctly. So let's go back to the same kind of data. We have the, uh, 
uh, exclusive or data here. And now one thing that we could try to do is to, the same way that we created one neuron, so uh, this is the neuron, yes. So here we just created a variable for the weight of one neuron and then the bias for one neuron and so forth. We could be tempted to do the same thing here where we create the hidden layer by creating the weight and the bias for neuron 1 and then the weights and the bias for neuron 2 in the hidden layer. So this would be uh, the first two neurons. And then we would do the same thing. Uh, so this basically is the hidden layer, the bias and the weights of neuron 1, bias and the weights of neuron 2. And then we add things here and we create the output neuron that receives as input the activation of the hidden layer and so forth. But as you can see, if, you, if we do things this way, uh, if we try to build a neural network with lots of neurons, this is really awful code where we are basically just copy-pasting things and changing names and, and things would be, and the graphs would be terrible to, to visualize at the end. So, let's, uh, uh, oh, then we can do the same thing at the end just to uh, minimize the, the quadratic error. So basically, the end of the, of the graph is the same thing. Uh, this, by the way, is what happens when we are uh, classifying the, the exclusive R. You see here the activation of the, neuro, the hidden uh, layer as we are training, and this is the result uh, at the output because the last neuron is not actually seeing data like this, but it's seeing this nonlinear transformation of the data. But this is not a very good implementation, so let's go back a few years to basic algebra and remember how to uh, multiply matrices. So remember that we are moving sensors here. Sensors are n-dimensional matrices. And we can do uh, matrix, matrix multiplication works like this. We have this, uh, for example, suppose that these are our inputs. We have four examples with two features. And we are uh, presenting these inputs to our network. If we represent our neurons, for example, suppose we have three neurons here, each neuron will have two input values uh, corresponding to each of the features, and we could represent the neurons as columns in this matrix, because now for each uh, value in this matrix, what we have is the sum of the products of the first feature by the first weight, and the second feature by the second weight, and then this is summed, which is exactly that weighted sum that we have in the neuron. So, if we represent a layer as a matrix of neurons, where with each neuron in one column and each feature in one row, and we represent our data, our input data, as a, a matrix with each example in one row and each feature in one column, we can just do the matrix multiplication here, and we obtain a matrix with uh, each example in one row and the activation of each neuron in one column. So, in this case, it's merely the, the weighted sum, but if we now apply the sigmoid function to each element of this matrix, we get the output of the neuron. So this is what we can use to implement the layers in our network instead of implementing each neuron individually, which would be awful. So we can create this function, layers, which receive uh, the, the input here, what the, the matrix that is being input into this layer, for the first layer, it's the actual input data. For the second layer, will be the output of the first layer, and so forth. The number of neurons in the layer, and the name we want to give to the layer. So we're going to use this uh, uh, name scope from TensorFlow, which uh, tells the, the graph, uh, when building the graph, that all these nodes belong to the same block, and we can give a name to that block. So this is used then when representing the graph so that we don't have this added complexity shown. We can, we can uh, organize things and also allows us to use uh, variables or uh, these uh, tensors and, and operators with the same name because we have different name scopes. So they can be called the same in, inside uh, different name scopes. So first we're going to create the weight for all these neurons. This has, uh, has the, the number of rows is the number of columns in the input, and the number of columns is the number of neurons. 
So this basically is this matrix here that represents the weight of the, the layer. The bias is just a vector of one uh, zero for neuron. We can start the bias at zero. The um, weight, it's important to start at random. If we start everything at zero, then the network gets stuck and doesn't learn properly. Now we can compute this uh, value here, so the multiplication of the, the matrix, the, the, the matrix multiplication of the inputs by the weight, and then we add the bias. Uh, remember that uh, uh, bias, the bias vector is a one-dimensional vector. This uh, matrix will be a two-dimensional matrix like this. Well, not like this because we, we are using two neurons, but if we use three, it will be like this. But uh, uh, TensorFlow has the same broadcasting uh, rules as NumPy, so it will add this uh, vector to each row of the matrix. So, in this case, we are adding the bias vector, which has as many values as the number of neurons, to each of the rows of the matrix. And then we apply the sigmoid. So, uh, we are creating here a set of operations that receive one tensor as input, and output as another tensor which has the activations of the neurons for all the examples uh, that came in. <coughs> and now we can create layer 1 based using this layer function uh, inputting the x values, the features, with two neurons and we call that layer 1. And now we can create layer 2 which receives that input layer 1 and then has one neuron and uh, we call that layer 2. So now the, the uh, mean squared error is, uh, depends on the output of, of layer 2, so on the results of this layer, and we use the same uh, uh, optimizer and so forth. So this uh, is now the graph. Instead of being this, uh, this horrible map here, you can see the graph, the, the graph on TensorFlow uh, <coughs> like this. So this is layer 1, which receives the input, layer 2, and then we have the computation for the, the gradient uh, on the cost function to optimize. Okay. And now we can do the same with the, the, the other set of data. So here we are looking at what's happening in the hidden layer, what's happening to the transformation of the data, and this results in this band in the, the frontier there. And this again is the, the error for, or the, the cost function that I use. So, uh, this graph, uh, I uh, created this with sensor board, and this is a, a tool that you can use to uh, follow, uh, either follow the training or look at the graph or look at the results of your network. So, this um, is useful for uh, monitoring training, for storing different logs or snapshots of your networks and so forth. And what you need to do is uh, first, uh, the way tensor board works is that it uh, uh, receives as an argument one folder for all the logs and each run, each execution of, of whatever model you want must be in a separate subfolder. One easy way of doing that in Python is you import this date time, you get a string based on the, the current time when you run your, your script and you create inside the, the directory for the log a new uh, folder with that timestamp. So it has some base name, uh, model, and then the timestamp. This guarantees that each time you run your code, you create a new folder for the log if you want to retain. If you don't, then you can just uh, delete all the folders, but this way you get everything organized for TensorBoard. Because then in TensorBoard you can select which runs to, to view, either all of them or just a few or whatever you want. Now, what you do is you create this file, uh, file writer uh, object that allows you to write to the log, so it serializes the data that you want to write and puts it in the correct format for TensorBoard. And you can create these summaries for uh, uh, outputting into the log the values of some operator. For example, this cost summary is a scalar summary. It means that it's just a single value. This is the name I want to give it on TensorBoard, and this is the operation that will be uh, logged. So this is the mean square error. It's the cost function that I'm uh, uh, optimized. 
Also, when we create a file writer, it, it logs a description of the graph that we want. So, in this case, if, since I'm putting everything in the default graph, I can use here get default graph from TensorFlow so that the, the, the graph that I created is output to the, to the log. So, you should do this after creating all the computation graphs so you get the complete graph on the log. So now, during the session, we can uh, either uh, customize the, the way the, the values are formatted for, for the summary. So uh, we, we have here, for example, create a value uh, for logging into the, uh, the log. Uh, we can create a, a tag, a number, a name for that value, and then we, uh, the value is the result of evaluating some, uh, some uh, uh, operation that we have. So we can store different values uh, that we want in, in the log. Uh, and then we create the summary. So basically this will be a string. It says to have the, the right format to go into the log. And then we write that into the, the file writer. And we, can, we also include the, the epoch because then these values can be plotted in a chart. So if we include the epoch, we can follow uh, the, the progress of the values. Uh, this is just so that you don't do this all the time. So if you have to, to run many, uh, many iterations, and if this takes some time to, for writing to, to the disk and so on, you can do this only, uh, in this case, every 1,000 times, every 1,000 efforts, I write one. Another easier way is that you create simply the, the, the summary object, and then you just write the, the evaluation of that object. So this this cost summary object in this case, or this summary object, already includes all the, uh, the code for com uh, converting the value into a string that, that goes into the log. So this is usually the, the easiest way. You create uh, a summary for some value that you want, specify a label and the operation, and then you uh, add, uh, add to the, your log the value associated with that with that summary. So it, it will run, it will evaluate the operation and part and the create a string for logging and then write to the file. Note that this only works inside the session because you have to evaluate your your graph to do this. Then when you uh, do that uh, or during your uh, run or afterwards, whenever you want to look at the log, you just run sensor board specifying the, the log directory, and then you open your browser. So this uh, TensorBoard runs as an HTTP server, uh, a local server, and on port 6006. So this looks like Goog, so it's from Google, and you, uh, it's easy to remember. So this is the, the, the port that you use, and I can show... Oh, I can show if this doesn't go... So let's. Uh, I have here, for example, the those uh, this last example for this graph. So this is okay. I have here in the log. So if I create uh, a terminal here, and then I can run uh, TensorBoard, <coughs> and then I specify the log folder, which is logs, I think, and this starts running the, the uh, server. So uh, when you get this message, it means that the server is running, uh, and now you can uh, go to the local, uh, local uh, port and use this port 6006, and this is the, uh, what is stored there in, in that uh, uh, this is a bit large. Okay, so here I have two runs. Uh, this second one, I just I aborted it after uh, a bit. The first one uh, is longer, and also this is the the mean square error that I uh, I uh, outputted to the log. Okay, and here we have the graph for the computation. So this is the, the computation graph. Those layers that I created. And since I used the name scope, all the, the operations inside the layer were, were uh, bunched together in this graph. But if you want to see what they have inside, you can double-click 
and you can see the, the different uh, parts uh, here, see the, the bias, the weights, and so on. And you can also uh, click each one and you have information of what, what is uh, going on in, this, in each part and the tensors that are going around so far. So here you can examine the, the graph and also the results that you want to output. So this is installed with, with TensorFlow. If you install TensorFlow, you have TensorBoard. The, the only thing you need to remember is that you have to run it on, on the shell or something like that, specify the log here. And if, this, if you're looking at this during uh, the training of your network, you can refresh or this uh, by default refreshes every 15 seconds or so you get an update of what is, of what is running. Okay, so this is just a basic introduction. We're going to be seeing a bit more, more details because uh, note that at this time uh, we're not really doing a stochastic gradient descent because we just have all the data in a constant and we're always using the same uh, data. Uh, so we're going to see how to use that. We're also going to see different uh, activation functions, different optimization algorithms and so on. But this is just the basic uh, that we're going to do now in the, in the tutorial class. Uh, so, to sum up, uh, TensorFlow has this, uh, remember what is underlying this, this is uh, the, the heart of this is uh, uh, that automated differentiation method that takes the computation graph and computes what, how we need to change the parameters to uh, minimize the cost function. So this is basically at the low level what you're going to do, you're going to create the computation graph use the optimizer and uh, fit uh, your value. Now, this is, uh, as we're going to start building more complex models, we're not going to do every layer by hand and so on. We have lots of interfaces for, for creating complete networks or layers, uh, specifying what we want. So we'll be also looking at those higher level interfaces, which are more practical for you to build more complex networks. But it's also important to understand how things work uh, at a lower level if you want to fiddle with some details. Uh, TensorBoard is useful for saving your, your, so you save your logs and then you view your logs during training or after training. But there is one thing that I would like to point out that uh, this will be rather different in TensorFlow 2.0. For example, you, you won't use fashion or initialize variables. You have function decorators for building the graph as functions uh, in Python, so it will be more Python-like and not uh, quite like this. But this is probably only something for next year. If you want to, uh, there is a, a, a YouTube video here from the developers explaining these changes, but that's for this year and for the final assignment, you still have to use TensorFlow as it is now. <coughs> 